Oh, the first time I heard the opera Die Todesstadt, I thought this is some of the most gorgeous music. I was totally transfixed. I've spent a lifetime in opera. The things that I remember most are the productions that we started, you might say, from scratch. To really be part of something from the ground up, where you really influence the whole look of something that goes on the stage. Florencia and el Amazonas of Daniel Catan. Two world premieres after that. The Scarlet Letter of Laurie Leipman, and then Gerald Cohen's Steal a Pencil for Me were real milestones in this company's history. I would say what we just completed here at Opera Colorado, the Opera Die Todesstadt, at this point is an absolute lifetime achievement. I think that both of us only dreamed of the possibility of ever doing Die Todesstadt. First of all, it's not done in the United States very much at all, and it's only really been done by the very biggest companies. Eric Korngold premiered Die Todesstadt in 1920. He was 22, 24 years old, very early in his career. Korngold was the 20th century's version of Mozart. There was great anticipation over the premiere of Die Todesstadt, so much so that it was premiered in two cities at the same time. It has a sophistication and a depth of soul that is remarkable. Taking place in the city of Bruges, this story revolves around two main characters, Paul, who is deeply mourning the death of his wife, Marie, and the character of Marietta, a dancer who looks exactly like Marie and becomes the unsuspecting victim of Paul's obsession. What unfolds is a torrid relationship that ends with Paul questioning what is real and what is just a dream. One of the many exciting aspects of getting to do this opera is to create it from the ground up. There's no production that exists here in the United States. Going from zero to 60 in a production like this, the first thing, how do we put together the team? Ari and I, for years, had talked about working with Chaz Raider Schieber. I picked up the phone and reached out to Chaz and said, hey, we're looking at doing a brand new production of this opera. There was this dead silence because it was a piece that's on his bucket list. So his enthusiasm was tremendous. We said, who would you want to work with to create the world that we are going to put up on the stage here at the alley? He immediately said, Robert Perziola, he can bring this to life in the most spectacular way. She has the corset on underneath this, yes. Is it possible that in this one uh, we go without the camisole? I know, everything. You can play in front of a mirror and determine what you think. Oh, gee. Well, you do that better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good thing. <laughs> it's wonderful, Sarah. It's my favorite opera in all the world. It's the only opera I listen to incessantly. And to have an opportunity to, again, start something from the ground up and dream about what we wanted this production to look like and feel like, that, at this point, is a huge career high for me. We chose the 1890s because that's when the novella that the opera is based on was published. With a piece that is as psychologically complicated as Die Todesstadt, the design can aid in telling the story. The notion that much of it is in a dream meant the second act could be both inside and outside at the same time. To have cathedral spires in the room that represent Bruges, the dead city. If you ever get to read the novella, 
There are hand drawings of the city. Bruges is a character in the opera. It's not just the setting, the place. Robert's design really aided enormously and honored the idea of things that are in our mind, in this case, in Paul's mind. We realize that both in the novella and in the opera, we have no idea who Paul is. And because in the opera, a portrait of his deceased wife features prominently, we decided that Paul would be a painter. Part of this depression and this darkness that he's in is that every day he gets up and starts a new portrait of his wife. We decided that the room that we were gonna create on stage was not just this shrine to the memory of his wife, but it was his studio. So he's living in the studio with all these things that remind him of his wife, and he uses those as the inspiration for the paintings he's creating. I don't know of any other production that's out there in Europe that really tries to give Paul an identity like that. Director Chaz Rader Schieber and I spoke several times about what do we think the story is about. And then we sort of do our own work. In this case, at least a year and a half, he worked by himself and with his designer, and I worked by myself and with the score. I wrote a letter to the orchestra saying this thing that we're going to do is going to be an incredible adventure for all of us and everyone involved in the production have to feel like they're bringing their whole soul to the process. Corn Gold writes with this idea that there's a simple musical gesture into which is poured an incredible amount of complex rhythmic energy. With the singers, we work day after day, six hours a day for several weeks. They have a level of intimacy with the material that the individual orchestra player in the pit can't possibly have. And so it's putting those two worlds together, making it so that the individual player in the orchestra feels that they understand how their part fits into the greater musical idea. Our orchestra here is incredibly dedicated. They were intensely prepared. It's a piece that we wouldn't have been able to successfully play until quite recently. I'm very pleased that we've been able to do it and, and do it on a, on a high level. Eric Korngold lived through World War I and had served in World War I. He had lived through Spanish flu. Certainly that influenced him in terms of his knowledge of death and how we deal with it. We experience loss in so many ways, and this opera brings that to light. Throughout the opera, we see the torment that he goes through and how that leads to incredible moments of disappointment and jealousy and anger. I can't tell you how many times after a show somebody came up to me and said, I've experienced that. When opera can touch somebody, that's what makes a piece timeless. In this particular case, opening night, we were very well prepared. Of course, everybody's nervous and excited. This particular time I felt we were ready to perform. By the time we got to that curtain coming down, I felt so proud and so relaxed. We had created something that was a huge benchmark in the artistic history of this company, but also it was something that really resonated musically and dramatically with our audience. That's what we strive to do with everything we put on the stage. 
And sometimes you do it at a level that is just undeniable. And this was one of those moments where everything seemed to align in just the right way.